Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study Lesson 17. We've been progressing very well through these lessons, uh, sometimes a little slower just to be able to uh, really chew on some of the content as we go through scripture. We're learning a, a lot about God. This is his story. This is about him. He is the main character, the central theme uh, of his redemption plan after he created a perfect world and man chose to follow in the way of Lucifer, Satan, who chose to become his own king, his own leader, his own authority. And, and Adam and Eve followed suit and the rest of mankind, uh, consequently born of Adam and Eve, were subjected to the curse of sin, born into sin in need of redemption. And so as the story unfolds, the narrative of, of God, we see the need of shifting our thinking, shifting our worldview to, to move from the pagan culture in which we were born and move toward, move out of the pagan culture and move toward God's culture, God's worldview. And so this is often a painful process for us as it requires confrontation, as our ideas are confronted by the word of God, as God's ideas come into tension with our own, and we are forced to make a decision. Do I believe God or do I believe my grandmother or my grandfather or my dad or my mom or my brother or my teacher, or my professor? Uh, the doctor, I, I have to make a choice. Do I believe God or do I believe man? Is God my authority or is, am I my authority or mankind? And so I'm constantly brought into tension. And as these, as these narratives unfold from scripture, it begins forming an interlocking web of, tr of truths, of beliefs, of uh, fundamental core values and core beliefs in my mind so that I, ha I have an answer to all of life's questions. And I find those answers in the Bible, in God's written word, and that reflect his heartbeat and his worldview. So as we approach lesson 17, we're going to notice that as, as Israel is in this this period of time of exiting uh, their um, slavery to eat the Egyptians and to the pagan world, a, a godless world that is full of idols and different gods. As they exit that, God has to teach them, and, and they have many lessons to learn about himself. And so God is, is building spiritual life into the Israelite people, a people who had for generations 400 years lived under the dominant and oppressive culture of the Egyptians. And, and poly, polytheists, they believed in many gods. And so God is, is uh, carving away the, uh, the core, at their core beliefs, bringing them around to rightful thinking so that they can become a people group that honors him, that glorifies him, that are counterculture to man's kingdom, counterculture to everything else in the world at that time, uh, a world that is set up in opposition, heavily opposition to God and heavily influenced by Satan himself. And uh, man's heart attitude, uh, born in sin, contrary to uh to trusting God and, and prone to, to trust in himself or herself and to elevate oneself to the position of authority and the position of God and to decide for themselves their own fate. And so uh, God rescues the people of Israel from that, beginning with Abraham. And, and he gives them signs, he, give them, he gives them promises, but the lessons are not easy for Israel. And so as we study, as we go through and review the key historical facts and narratives of the people of Israel, you're going to realize and you're going to see the uh, application for you and I today as, as Christ followers, as people born in a time frame after the coming of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Messiah, 
the one who died and shed his blood for the payment of our sin, and having accepted him as our Savior, now in this period of the ecclesia, the church, God establishing the body of Christ here on earth and his kingdom through us, uh, you will you will notice the patterns of and applications of God's ideas and his dealings with Israel and the people of that time and how it is applicable to us today. So as we go through this lesson, we will we will make key points as we go along to to identify this shift that 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 must take place as we move from the pagan kingdom of man that is based on works and that's based on his own ideas and move into the kingdom of God, which is based on God's grace, his mercy, his love and compassion toward his creation. Uh, he values us. He values his creation and has set forth a way to save mankind in his way on his on his terms and so as abraham chose god and to believe god and it was credited to him as righteousness so god calls all of his descendants his descendants faith descendants as well as physical descendants to trust in him and to be a kingdom set apart for himself. So God is working very strongly on people's attitudes and, and, and their heart issues, not just carving away the, our, our, our behavior uh, because behavior is a result of our hearts. And so he focuses on the hearts and that's what's, what, what we're going to see. So <clears throat> as we review and look at the uh, identify what time period we're in, <clears throat> in lesson 17 uh, covers this period of conquest. The book of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and parts of Deuteronomy is what uh, uh, contains many of these accounts and the spiritual lessons which we are about to learn. So in this lesson, we're going to be covering seven points and keep these seven points in mind and uh, guaranteed this, these, uh, um, this lesson 17, I may uh, cut into two or three segments, but uh, we will be walking through each of these seven uh, key events. And we'll be observing what God was teaching to the Israelites and then glean lessons that we can apply to our own spiritual lives. God's word is applicable all throughout history and all throughout time. Uh, the, the covenants that he has may have changed for different people, which we learn throughout these lessons, but uh, his character and nature does not change and his word lasts forever. So these seven events that we'll cover, uh, they span a, a period of 40 years. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind as we go through. We're going to go through and quickly accelerate the time, uh, the flash of time, and, and cover about 40 years of, of time. So the, uh, as you keep in mind the geography and the uh, command of God, God had called the people of Israel to occupy this new land that is flowing with milk and honey, a place of blessing for them, a home for them, a place to belong that, that they can call their own. And God had already in his word set forth a plan and said, this is the territory in which you will own. And, and as you look at this land, it's kind of interesting, this long and skinny piece of property. That is what God promised to Israel to take possession of, to own it, and to walk by faith in that ownership, trusting that God indeed is going to provide everything that he promised them. So this is their mission. Is it clear to them what their mission is? Absolutely. God made it overly and abundantly clear to Israel. This is what you're to do. This is how you're going to do it. And you're going to follow my instructions step by step. And trust me in every, every battle, every, every um, uh, camp that you build and make. Follow me. Follow my, my indications and my leadership. Follow the man that I chose. It was Moses and Aaron. And then Moses passed this responsibility on to Joshua. 
and uh, the elders that were to follow Joshua. So there was a chain of command, and, and Joshua led the people as he followed himself, uh, Yahweh and his word. So let's go into this first covenant, and you will, you'll recall this covenant, or not covenant, but this event. You'll recall it because we've already covered it. So I won't go into much detail on these first uh, two or three uh, events, but uh, we, will, we will look at what... Um, uh, some of the lessons that are gleaned from here as God focuses on the spiritual life of Israel and the lessons that we learn from it as well. So the first one we'll cover is, cover is the covenant breaking at Sinai with the calf idol. And what this idol did, what the situation did was it revealed the heart of Israel. It revealed it. Uh, what may have been hidden below, below the surface, in their deep inside their worldview, which often uh, we hide our worldview, our core beliefs. We keep it in secret, and and we we externally uh, adhere to the laws and obey that which is is um, uh, gets us good brownie points and 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 provides us with the things that we need. We we choose not to break laws because of the consequences, getting a fine or whatever it may be. And so superficially, we may obey the the traffic laws, but inside we're just we're just seething because I I just absolutely hate that stop sign that's in the road. I I'm so frustrated at those stop sign. I, if it was me, I would just blow through it. And so our heart is often far from our behavior. And sometimes when no one's looking, and this is what happen, happens to uh, folks in the country that I lived in for many years called Paraguay, uh, it, a traffic light, anytime after midnight uh, and about five in the morning, uh, it doesn't matter what color it is, people blow through the, the lights. It doesn't matter. And, and so it reveals the true heart. And that is that if uh, if there were no consequences, we'll do whatever, whatever we want to. And so in this type of similar context, Israel, Israel was superficially accepting Yahweh as their Lord, as their king, as their ruler, and, and superficially were in awe of his wonderful glory and his his power and might they were they they were enchanted with it but their hearts were still far from it and so the when they called um uh, Aaron to make this calf of gold their hearts their true inner their worldview was was laid bare and it was shown and it was um demonstrated to all and God was furious with them and uh, and dealt with their hearts, and he punished them. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 16 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him, and love him, and serve him with all your heart and soul. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. So this word change, God is dealing with their hearts. This word change is also translated circumcise. God is calling them to change their hearts, to circumcise their hearts, to cut away, uh, to separate themselves from the world, to repent is also another way that this could be translated. And so years earlier, you see this idea of circumcision, the cutting away of flesh being introduced by God to Abraham as a physical, uh, uh, physical sign of the covenant that, that God and Abraham held together, that God made to Abraham. Abraham who responded to God's word in faith and said, I believe you. I'm going to obey you. Yes, you have a land for me. I, I'm going, I, I'll, I'll go and I'll move to Canaan. You are going to give me um, millions of descendants? Absolutely. Uh, I'll make sure I, my wife and I try to have kids. Um, 
you're you're gonna bless all the nations of the world through me all right i don't know how you're gonna do that but go for it uh i here i am i believe you god and it was credited to him as righteousness and as a sign uh, Abraham, uh, set apart from all the other nations, was to introduce, was to practice, was to cut away the flesh um, uh, of their private parts, an organ of their uh, the male body, in order for them to to uh, to have a sign that they were indeed set apart, different, counterculture. But it is this is a a, a fleshly cutaway, a physical sign. And God is saying, look, Israel, I'm sorry, but the physical sign is not enough. You can't be my child, my son, if you don't have a change of heart. You can be Abraham's descendant. You can cut away physically. You can physically and outwardly observe all the rules and regulations and the law. In fact, you could fulfill them uh, nearly to perfection. But if your heart is far from me, the sin that you were born into, uh, I'm sorry, that cannot, there is nothing external that can solve that. Only I can solve that for you. And I do it through the sacrifice of temporal sacrifice of a lamb and the promise of a redeemer. But believe in me, trust in me by faith, change your heart, stop being stubborn. So the circumcision of the heart is necessary for us uh, today, um, not only for the people of Israel. You and I are often become and are tempted or and are seduced to become uh, legalistic people, people who outwardly, outwardly we go to church, outwardly we smile, outwardly we dress nice, we we take showers and we smell good. We we look good. We may we make uh, abstain from different uh, um, uh, substances. Maybe a cigar or a cigarette, or maybe we abstain from alcoholic beverages or or smoking weed, or or we abstain from all kinds of uh, of practices uh, that may lead us into uh, in, in, into uh, slavery and bondage. But we, our hearts, if our hearts are not the, what's dealt with, if that's not where we're focused on, then our, our hearts are, we've lost the battle. Our hearts are lost. And our conduct should be a reflection of our heart. The, in, the change must be inward. A heart of faith, a heart that trusts God, that loves God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And that is what circumcision uh, is to look like in God's eyes, the change of the heart, um, uh, moving from rebellion, moving from, uh, from my own ideas, moving from my own kingship and my own lordship and my, my loyalties to mankind, my loyalties to, uh, to different earthly, earthly kingdoms, and to, to move my, my loyalties to God, and to uh, submit to his authority in my life, to walk with him by faith. I dare say that when God is our Lord, when he is our king, you will see uh, our, our, our loyalties with him will make itself manifest as good citizens of our country, as healthy citizens of our state and of our, uh, of our cities. We will then uh, be model citizens within uh, a, a nation as we submit ourselves to the kingship of God and of Jesus Christ. So, so God is encouraging mankind here. Turn away from relying on yourselves. That, that is a, an attitude of repentance. Move away. Uh, and move away from this uh, Canaanite system, this Babylonic system. Move away from uh, Cain's way. Move away from uh, Egypt's way, and 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 move toward the kingdom of God. Move toward worship of Him. This is what God longs for. That our the attitudes of our hearts are dealt with. Don't delay this. Repent. If you have sin in your life, confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful. God, God, the one who gave Jesus Christ a sacrifice for your sin, he is faithful 
and just. He brought condemnation, and Jesus Christ took that condemnation for your sin and my sin, my rebellion and your rebellion. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us, to purify us, to make us clean from all unrighteousness and and declare us righteous before him. And this, this confession has to happen on a regular basis because we suffer from uh, um, this strong inclination to do evil and to be our own kings. So let's move away from this uncircumcised heart and, and, and embrace the circumcised heart. And uh, what is wonderful about today is that we have the Holy Spirit in our life that convinces us of sin. He, he, he brings to light issues in our lives. And so listen to the Spirit of God when, when he, he tells you, hey, you, you just sinned. Hey, Mike, uh, uh, knock, knock, um, look, uh, wake up. Hey, you, you, you've, you, you've really sinned. And so your heart accuses you. The Holy Spirit reminds, reminds you that of his word and says, you messed up. Now uh, confess that and get it right with me. Return to me, repent, move from uh, evil and move toward good. Uh, repent from your man-made ways and embrace God's ways by faith, accepting your, your uh, identity in him, what I've done for you, says God. So what the God was teaching the, the Israelites at Sinai is that he requires them to have circumcised hearts. So turn to him for salvation, for meaning in life, for instruction, for a new way to live where he is our final authority in everything. So that's, that is God's call for us. These are the lessons that we learn from Israel. You're, we're going to learn a lot of lessons from Israel. Unfortunately, uh, they're tough lessons. Uh, I would like to be able to say that the story of Israel, their, their, uh, their historical account is one of, of flourishing and absolute victory in, in all areas. And they are a model nation for us to follow. But unfortunately, uh, the majority of these stories have a negative side to them. And, and, and they serve as warnings to us today. And so as we go through these, we're going to see failure after failure after failure, after failure, as Israel uh, uh, walks in rebellion and in disobedience and in faithlessness. But it's a lesson for us. It is, it's not too late for us to learn the hard lessons that Israel were, uh, had to learn as well. Romans 2, 28 says, For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents, or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, you are a Jew. A, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. That's what I want. I want the Holy Spirit to produce in me his life, a changed heart, one that reflects God's heart, one that reflects his character and nature. So let's listen to the Spirit of God in our lives. Let's move on to the second account. It is the declaration of holy war. Again, this is going to be familiar from the former lesson. So we'll go over it quickly. The declaration of holy war when Israel's in the desert and God commanded them to declare holy war on Canaan's inhabitants. Remember it said in Deuteronomy 20, in those towns that the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, destroy every living thing. That's, that's tough. You must completely destroy the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. So it's a picture of the conquest and uh, of the Jews 
or a picture of, of, uh, of a, a kingdom that God has chosen that has responded by faith and that, um, that God's grace is demonstrated through them and throughout history. And the Canaanites are a picture of God's uh, hate for evil and that he's going to separate good from evil and that the grace period will definitely have an end to it and that evil people will, will be separated from God forever permanently into a final judgment. And so this miniature, uh, small scale, uh, holy war is a picture of a much broader global and, and all, that covers all of history uh, where God will bring an end to mankind's evil and to evil itself and where Satan himself will be cast into the lake of fire and all those who follow him. And so it is a, 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 a warning preview of the final judgment that God will enact on mankind. So what do we learn from this? Well, we see that people will often bring accusations against God. Uh, and, and they want it one way or they want it the other way. They, want, they, 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 they try to have uh, it, it their way all the time. And, and, and this is not possible. And I'll explain myself here. We have people who, during periods of grace, where God extends long times, time frames for people to repent to him, they, uh, they complain about how God uh, does not bring uh, judgment to evil and that, that evil and, and good coexist and that, that good people suffer. And, and why isn't God just and to bringing an end to evil. He is not a good God, therefore. He's not strong enough. He's not powerful enough. But then the same people will accuse God when he does judge sin and say, why did God, why is God so evil? How he destroys so many people. Why can't he just leave people alone and give them time to repent? And, it, and, and people, uh, uh, basically, God can't win. Uh, people are going to judge him. They accuse him when he's grace, full of grace and extends periods of time for repentance. They accuse him when he does bring judgment. But you cannot have it both ways. If people object to evil and want it completely gone and obliterated, there has to be a judgment. If you want to live in a perfect society, there has to be judgment. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a perfect society and not have judgment. Uh, there has to be an end to grace. And that's a hard thing to swallow for some. And yet this is how God designed it. There indeed does come a time of the end of grace where judgment comes and evil and good is separated. Where, where God separates the, uh, and no longer allows for the coexistence. And so God uh, uses this picture of the holy war, of the conquering of the land of Canaan, uh, to uh, bring to judgment evil and to uh, allow for the Israelites to dwell in a land where they could prosper and not be oppressed and not be tempted by the society around them to also do evil and to practice evil and to be led astray. Um, you can't have both worlds. Let's go into the third event. And this covers the rebellion. Uh, uh, this is, this is the, the plan A, the first, first uh, opportunity of entrance into the land of Canaan. And the rebellion that took place um, at, against the invasion at Kadesh and Barnea, covered in Numbers 13, chapters 13 and 14. So if you want to look at the map with me again, uh, you notice Egypt is way off to the uh, left-hand side. Let's see if my mouse shows up here. Yes, Egypt is off, off of in this area. And, and they're... The plan God had for them, the first plan was to enter in from the bottom here at this area, the Kadesh Barnea area, 
If you recall, the actual entrance later on in plan B was up in Jericho, uh, up much further north in plan B, which we'll look into a little bit later. But this first section, plan A, was the in, in initial place where they were to enter. And God had prepared the people of that land uh, to be conquered. They were frightened by everything that they had heard from uh, the land of Egypt and the, the exit and the exodus of the people and how God had destroyed the Egyptians by supernatural means. And, and the people uh, were completely um, mentally conquered. They feared God. They feared the people of Israel. But when, when uh, the, Moses sent the 12 spies into the land to explore, these men, these 10 men, went in with a mentality of defeat, defeatedness, a defeatist mentality where, oh, they're so big, they're giants, we're just little teeny grasshoppers in their eyes. When in reality, when in reality, God had already prepared the way for them so that they could practically walk in into the land and take over because the people of that land saw themselves as little grasshoppers uh, in, in lieu of this massive God, Yahweh, who is uh, with this horde of people called the Israelites, and they were deathly afraid and could have wiped out the people uh, of the land had they entered into the land by faith knowing, um, uh, trusting in this almighty God that had brought them out of Egypt. Had they walked in with the right attitude, with prepared hearts, hearts of faith, they would have completely uh, and very quickly conquered the land and took occupation of it. But is that was that their heart attitude? No, they rebelled against God. They, re, they said, no, we don't trust you. No, we're little grasshoppers. They were faithless. They were faithless. They did not trust God, except for Joshua and Caleb, whom God then spared their lives so that they could indeed, men of faith, enter into the land. But all the other descendants were uh, 40 years were uh, doomed to wander into the desert and, and die there. So what is God teaching them? That they need to trust God's word over their own feelings, their own psychological state, their own state of mind. I know you and I go through this every day. In fact, have you heard the term so-and-so is facing mental illness? Is that not something that is very prevalent in today's society? It is, it is a... a pandemic. It is, it is global. And, and, and you and I have also suffered and may suffer uh, even now from, from psychological defeatedness. When we uh, are, are encouraged by God, I am trustworthy. I am huge. I'm this big, massive God who permeates all of creation. I'm, I'm the God of all the universe. In fact, the universe is so small, it cannot contain me because I am God. Don't walk with a defeatist mentality into a kingdom that is under my powerful hand and control. Yes, I have given leeway to Satan to function and to operate. Yes, mankind, I have given them free will to walk and choose to obey me and walk as my children. They have freedom to choose me. I have extended all kinds of liberty and freedom in my creation. But I haven't lost control, guys. I, I'm still the king of kings. I, I am the Lord of lords. I am the Lord of Satan. I rule over everything. There is not one single hair of your head that I do not, I do not have numbered. There's not a single bird in, in all of the earth that, that is not under my, uh, my consciousness. There's not a single cell in your body that I do not comprehend and, 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 and can identify. If I choose to, I can listen to your prayer. I can listen to you. I love you. I, I want you to trust me 
and to be conscious of me on a regular basis, on a day-to-day basis as a father and son that lives together in the same household. Don't walk around the house uh, separated from me and, and not talking to each other. What kind of existence is that? It's miserable having a father and son that, that, that can't talk to each other because one has offended the other. Get it right. Uh, bring, come back into communion with me. Trust me. Let's, 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 let's clear the air. Let's get back into fellowship again. Um, come and trust me. I love you overly and abundantly so much that, that your little, your finite mind cannot even comprehend. So yes, we, we as human beings do indeed struggle with, with, with feelings, emotions, uh, psychological and mental weaknesses. We do. Uh, we do struggle with that. That's part of our everyday life. But God is extending to us victory. He's extending to us the power to overcome uh, our inadequacies by walking in dependence upon God. Uh, accepting his sovereign will, accepting his kingship, accepting that everything else that is around us, all of the material world in which we live are little grasshoppers. And in Christ, we are the giants. Not because we're so amazing, but because we have an amazing God and he has called us his child. So these are the lessons that God has for us. Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, therefore, God has highly exalted him. He's talking about Jesus Christ here and bestowed on him, on Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he came in the flesh. He became a man. He became sacrifice for us. And he lives again. And he said, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We are in Christ Jesus. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is nothing that is too great for me to be able to uh, confront in all the evil circumstances in my life that, that invade my thoughts, invade my heart. There's nothing too big because I am in Christ Jesus. He is Lord and he is my Lord. So that's what he's inviting us to do, to walk by faith in him. So let's not walk in, in defeat discouraged, fearful, hopeless. Let's walk in victory by faith in Christ Jesus, psychologically sound because he has made us new, a new creation, new minds, new hearts, a new spirit, one that's alive in him. We're going to go through number four, and then we'll close at number four, and I'll leave the other ones for the next lesson. The victory at at Jericho, covered in Joshua 6. So they wandered for 40 years, 38 years they wandered in the desert, and every uh, adult in that generation died except for Joshua and Caleb. And on the 40th year, God gave uh, them the green light to go in, into Canaan through this time through Jericho. Why in the world did God pick Jericho? Why did he not pick an easier, more smaller town to work with? Uh, something, uh, maybe give them a little battle so that, um, so that they can uh, uh, take, take little bite-sized pieces at a time. Uh, don't we do that in our culture? Yeah. I'm only going to give my son a little teeny, teeny bite-sized responsibility today because there's no way uh, he'll be able to handle the big stuff, right? Uh, 
why should I throw my kid in the pool <laughs> to learn to swim in the deep end? You know, I, 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 let's start with the little stuff. That's how we think, right? I'm not saying we're wrong. I'm just saying that that's how we think and process things in our culture. But God sent them this time to Jericho, a very, very, very fortified city. Isn't it? And, he, and he lays out this extremely strange plan. But before he, before they go, Joshua, the leader, has to meet with God. He has to have an encounter. Okay? How important it is to have a meeting with God before, before we face the massive fortified cities in our lives. Let's, let's, let's read about this meeting. Joshua 5.13 says, When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, so he's really close, on the verge of entrance, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of me, uh, in front of him, with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him, him and demanded, are you a friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy, and Joshua did as he was told. Do you remember who else did that? Where did we hear about someone removing their sandals when they were called by God and they had a meeting with God? It was Moses before he was called to go and take on this massive project of confronting the biggest and baddest Pharaoh of all time. And the one who is feared all throughout the land. He met with God. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua had a meeting with God, with Yahweh. This is what we call a theophany, a pre-incarnate uh, uh, appearance of Jesus Christ, a pre uh, an incarnation of the Son who, uh, of God who made himself revealed to man as he did in many times in the Garden of Eden when he talked with uh, Cain, when he talked with, uh, um, uh, with Abraham, God, uh, when he talks with, uh, um, with Moses, he appears uh, the son of God, the commander of the Lord's army and the commander of the army of Israel bows down before him and says, yep, you're the king. I'm at your service. Tell me what to do. That's the position God wants us in. That's how he wants us to respond, to take off our sandals. I'm not talking literally when we go into worship at a church uh, we don't remove our shoes in our, our United States and Western culture. If you are in Japan, it may be a really good idea to. But uh, in the United States, we don't do that. Uh, but here, we let's spiritually remove our shoes. Remove, remove that which holds us back into sheer worship of God and to uh, stand before a holy God and, and yield our life to him, bow down to him and say, what would you have your servant do? That is when, that's the position God wants us in when he's about ready to take us into conquer a big area in our life that is unconquered. Sin in our life, fortresses in our worldview, views and beliefs that we have held to so strongly and tenaciously for, for years. My dad did it this way. My grandfather did it this way. My great, 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 great grandfather did it this way. We have always done it this way. And they're fortresses in our minds. And Jesus says, take off your sandals. Be at my command because together we're going to conquer these areas in your life, these fortresses. And we are going to own them. We're going to conquer. We're going to take them out together. Let's continue. Joshua 6. So the Lord gives instructions, and it is an extremely strange instruction. One I certainly have never seen in any kind of military campaign manuals. But here you've got it. 
Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. They were afraid. No one was allowed to go in, out, or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and its, all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on, on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. I wonder what kind of shouts they gave. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. I'm sorry, but this has to be some of the strangest instructions I have ever heard in any kind of military uh, campaign. And one wonders, why? Why would God do it this way? And I think, although we could deeply analyze this, I think the general uh, content that we can walk away with is that Yahweh was instructing them in this way to show that his way is always the best way. It doesn't matter how strange it sounds. It doesn't matter how logical or illogical it seems to be for mankind. When it is his way, it is the right way. Without question. And Joshua said, yes, sir. I just had a meeting with you um, outside of Jericho. I just met the the Lord of the 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 king, the commander of the the hosts of the Lord. I just met him, and and he gave me instruction. Yeah, this is what we're gonna do. This is the plan. It may not sound logical. We may have never been done before this way, but this is God's way, and we will obey by faith. So God's lesson here for Israel was to trust God more than what they might think was an, an insufficient and foolish battle plan. And for us, it's to learn not to depend on myself, my thinking, my education. Oh, but I have a degree. I have a doctorate degree. I have a master's degree. I have an engineering degree. I know how things work. I'm, I'm an electrician. I'm a, a butcher. I know how to carve up meat. I know how things are to be done. I'm a cook. I'm a pastor. I'm a missionary. I've been trained cross-culturally by the best, best training centers of, in all the world, the most advanced and cutting edge. I, I know how to, things work. I know how things work. I, got, I have God all figured out. No, God is teaching us to depend on him. To not trust in our understanding, our education. Yes, we educate in worldview change. Yes, we do. We, we set aside blocks like uh, of time of learning, like interlocked Bible study to learn about God and his worldview. But as we learn his worldview, we understand that God is asking us, inviting us to learn to depend on him every single moment of our lives. Yes, he gives us abilities. Yes, he gives us creativity. Yes, he gives us brains and, and the ability to, to rationalize. Yes, yes, he gives us freedom to express his character. Yes, absolutely. It was Joshua and his crowd did not stand around and, and then watch people just kind of have heart attacks and die on their own. No, they took sword in hand and destroyed the people, the inhabitants of, of Jericho. There was action. They didn't sit by with their arms crossed. There was action. Yes, we have action, but it is action that walks in dependency upon God by faith, no matter how illogical it is. All right. 
Let's stop there today. Thank you very much and may God bless you.